in order to develop a thorough understanding of DNA replication, one has to keep in mind a couple of essential concepts with regards to DNA. And one is the location of this vital material to the cell. DNA that encodes the instructions for the building of the protein cells need to perform their daily functions is going to be known as genomic DNA, and this is going to be stored in the nucleus of the cell. Therefore, we can say with confidence that DNA replication is a process that takes place inside of the nucleus. A second concept about DNA one has to keep in mind is that the reason cells duplicate their DNA through DNA replication is to ensure that when cells divide, each of the daughter cells made during cell division receives a complete and faithful set of genetic instructions. And so you may recall that when we studied about the cell cycle, there was this longest uh, lived stage of a cell known as interface. And part of interface included a subphase known as the S or synthesis subphase of interface. And so that's where we learn the chromosomes are duplicated and exactly what is being duplicated is the DNA of a cell. Now that we have identified these two key concepts about DNA, let's go ahead and take a look at the process and how it occurs. Beginning with uh, identifying the key players, which are going to be enzymes that uh, carry this process from beginning all the way to completion. The first enzyme that I want to talk about is going to be DNA helicase. And we can see DNA helicase uh, in this illustration, it's uh, colored green, and the function is performing is breaking the hydrogen bonds that exist between uh, base pairs uh, in the middle of the DNA molecule where you see like steps of a ladder. That's where the bases are connected by hydrogen bonds. These are being broken by helicase. And so in a way, helicase is unzipping and unwinding the DNA molecule. Well, this unwinding is going to eventually cause tension away from where helicase is. And so this part of DNA will eventually get so tight uh, from all the over twisting. Uh, and uh, what we need now is to relieve that tension and the enzyme that's gonna be responsible for this is known as topoisomerase. Topoisomerase makes a cut in the DNA and then allows the strands to uh, swivel and untwist, relieving that tension. Another detail we want to keep in mind is the work that primase is going to be doing. So primase is an enzyme that is going to be responsible for building a scaffolding. A scaffolding is like something polymerase, the enzyme that actually copies DNA bases, needs to stand on, something that it needs to grab onto so it can uh, begin the process. So there has to be something before bases can be added and that something is going to be known as a DNA primer. So this enzyme known as primase builds a short sequence of RNA nucleotides we call the primer. Once a primer has been established, we're going to see another enzyme known as DNA polymerase 3, and now we're moving to this illustration uh, on the bottom of this slide, and you can see that DNA polymerase 3 is going to be doing the process of adding bases to the growing strand of DNA following the complementary rules we had learned before. If the original or parental strand of DNA has an A, then on the new strand of DNA, there's going to be a T. If the old or parental DNA strand has a C, DNA polymerase 3 is going to be adding a G on this growing strand of DNA. Another important detail to keep in mind here is that DNA polymerase is going to be able to add bases to the growing strand of DNA only to the three prime direction of the daughter DNA molecule. So if we look at this illustration, the light blue, this is going to be the new DNA strand that is being synthesized by DNA polymerase 3. And notice how bases are only being added to the three prime end. 
Keep in mind that the three prime end is going to be what a hydroxyl group is ready to participate in dehydration synthesis of this strand of DNA. So we need that hydroxyl group for new covalent bonds to be formed. The making of DNA is not a process that uh, occurs in the same way for both of the parental strands of DNA. So on the one side, we're going to see a leading strand. And I want to be clear here that even though we don't see a primer on this end, this strand began with a primer. There is no DNA copying or synthesis of DNA that will take place except if we have a primer. So we don't see the primer over here, but there's a primer. And, and as long as this strand continues to grow in the three prime direction, the process is going to be continuous. But if we look at this side of the DNA over here, take a look at the labels. On this end of the bottom strand of DNA, there is a three prime. Therefore, uh, in the complementary strand of DNA that we're building, at first we're going to have a five prime and DNA cannot be added to this five prime end over here. So we cannot, and I want to see if I can uh, make, maybe make this larger. So DNA polymerase cannot add bases to this five prime end. So this strand on the bottom cannot grow in the same direction as the leading strand. And so what we have to do here at this point is, once again, use primase to put a primer, but now the assembly of DNA will continue on the three prime direction, but in a direction that is opposite to the leading strand of DNA, which is going in this case to the left, the lagging strand of DNA is going to be going to the right. And so notice how along the way there is going to be several primers that are going to be established by primase. And uh, eventually DNA polymerase three comes and begins copying the bases, A with T and C with G as we've learned previously, but always in the three prime direction of DNA. What uh, this does is that this lagging strand of DNA is going to be assembled piece by piece. We have to wait for another section of this bottom strand of DNA to open up for a new primer to be established and for DNA polymerase three to assemble DNA on the three prime direction. And so as you can see in this illustration is that here's a section of DNA that has been completed. Here's another section of DNA that has been completed. Here's one that is beginning completion here, one that is yet to start. Because you see all of these fragments of DNA. That's what we call this the lagging strand and it is not continuous. There are all of these interruptions. The short pieces of DNA that are being assembled in the lagging strand of DNA have a name and these are known as Okazaki fragments. Here's a name you want to pay attention to and you want to remember. Okazaki fragments are named so in honor to its discoverer. Dr. Akaz Okazaki, a Japanese geneticist, was the one that first noticed that on the lagging strand of DNA, this synthesis was being done piece by piece, little by little, and that fragments of DNA would eventually be joined uh, together. Now we have to make reference to another enzyme, and that is going to be DNA polymerase 3. Notice that we're trying to copy DNA into DNA. And you may be wondering, well, what is going to happen to these RNA nucleotides over here? And how is RNA different? Well, RNA is different in that it has a different sugar. Instead of the sugar deoxyribose in DNA, RNA has the sugar ribose. Also, one of the bases of DNA, uh, thiamine, doesn't exist in RNA. RNA has its own base, which is called uracil. For this and a few other details, we cannot leave RNA here in place. This RNA has to be removed one nucleotide at a time and replaced with DNA nucleotides. And the enzyme responsible for doing this work is going to be known as DNA polymerase one. And we can see it at work here on this section of the illustration. DNA polymerase one clips out one RNA nucleotide and places the correct nucleotide uh, where it should go. 
but the work is still not done yet because we have all of these Okazaki fragments. Now we need to connect all the little pieces that are yet not joined. I'm going to um, make this illustration larger again. You can see that there is a gap in the DNA right here. There's another gap over here. And so where all of these Okazaki fragments have been put together, there is a bond that is missing. We need to make another one of those phosphodiester links, a special type of covalent bond, and that is going to be the job of DNA ligase to be able to join these Okazaki fragments into what will now be a continuous strand. So in review, what we can say about uh, DNA replication is that there is going to be a leading strand which is assembled continuously because it continues to be assembled in the three prime direction. On the complementary strand of DNA, the parental strand of DNA, we cannot do the same thing because in the same direction of the growth for the leading strand, what you will see in the alternate strand of DNA is going to be a five prime direction. And here the simple and key concept to keep in mind is that DNA polymerase 3 can only add nucleotides to the three prime end. This will make the lagging strand of DNA to be assembled piece by piece. The pieces are known as Okazaki fragments. And now we're going to need a DNA ligase to come and join those uh, pieces of DNA by establishing a bond between the Okazaki fragments. One more thing that I want to tell you about DNA replication before I conclude this video is that this is a really speedy process. The estimates for how quickly bases are copied by DNA polymerase vary from one source to another. And so some sources estimate that in mammals, DNA polymerase works at a rate of about 50 bases per second. And that's a real fast rate. If you look at prokaryotes like bacteria, it is actually going to be 10 to 20 times faster according to some estimates. So just to give you an idea, uh, about 500 pairs or bases per second are going to be copied in bacteria. The reason DNA replication must be speedy is because when cells need to divide, they must do so quickly and there's no time to wait. Imagine when you have an injury and you have to heal that injury by the making of new cells. You don't want to be waiting for weeks and months before all the DNA in the nucleus of the cell gets duplicated or replicated. So to give you an idea for, you know, the importance of how quickly replication happens and why this matters, consider what happens in fruit flies. Well, fruit flies happen to have gigantic uh, chromosomes. And the scientists have estimated that if replication began at one end of the chromosome, imagine that this chromosome here is the entire chromosome of um, one of these uh, fruit flies. If you began at one end, the process of replication, and continued copying the one strand uh, continuously from one end all the way to the other end nonstop, it would take about 16 days. But it doesn't take that long. In reality, the process uh, takes only about three minutes. And the reason is because in a single chromosome of a fruit fly, scientists have counted about 6,000 of these replication bubbles. And so these replication bubbles each come with two forks. And uh, in, in each fork, there's going to be a leading strand and a lagging strand that is being assembled. Consequently, because of all of these many places simultaneously copying DNA in one chromosome, the process will only take place, uh, will only occur in, in three minutes, will only require three minutes, is what I want to say. So in this illustration you see over here, you can notice, uh, in fact, the picture of those replication bubbles. Here's a replication bubble over here. There's another replication bubble over here. There is a larger replication bubble over here. So this will be one replication fork. Here's another replication fork. There'll be more replication forks. Uh, two inside of each one of these bubbles. And uh, thank goodness, because of this DNA replication and how it makes faithful copies of the chromosomes in our cells, we can rely in the fact that cells made by mitosis are going to be genetically identical to one another and we will have new cells 
whenever we need them for growth or for repair.